Lou on Stanford Jr. developed typhoid fever two months before his 16th birthday while on a grand tour of Europe with his parents, initially falling ill in Athens. He died in Florence several weeks later on March 13, 1884. Stanford, the namesake of the eponymous university, thus had the ill fortune of acquiring his infection well before the age of antibiotics, an age which some, however, have said is heading towards its end. And Salmonella typhi, the cause of typhoid fever, demonstrates this downward slide. The first antibiotics clearly effective in the treatment of typhoid fever were chloramphenicol and ampicillin. By 1972, however, resistance to these antibiotics had become widespread. Trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole then became the treatment of choice until the end of the 1980s, when increasing resistance resulted in the substitution of ciprofloxacin as the first-line therapy. We are now seeing an increasing number of reports of reduced susceptibility of Salmonella typhi not only to ciprofloxacin, but to third-generation cephalosporins as well. The story of Salmonella typhi is, unfortunately, not unique. The path of resistance taken by Klebsiella pneumoniae is an instructive example of the march towards resistance. In 2010, a U.S. national study found that resistance of this organism to all antibiotics tested since 1998 had increased and that 17.2% were by then resistant to ceftazidine, 13.8% to tobramycin, 12.7% to piperacillin tazobactam, and 4.3% to imipenem. A major mechanism of resistance was the expression of extended spectrum beta-lactamases, which had evolved from the native chromosomal TEM and SHV enzymes and, mobilized on plasmids, allows their ready transmission to other organisms. Further molecular evolution led to the emergence of carbapenemases, which are often expressed in organisms that are also resistant to aminoglycosides, trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole, and fluoroquinolones, a frightening witch's brew of antibiotic resistance as evidenced by the tragic results of a recent outbreak. A 43-year-old woman with pulmonary alveolar proteinosis was discharged from the NIH Clinical Center on July 15, 2012, after 32 days of hospitalization. She had been transferred there from a facility in New York City, and since she was known to be colonized with a KPC-producing Klebsiella pneumoniae, she was immediately placed into enhanced isolation. This organism was not seen in any other patient until it was recovered from a tracheal aspirate of one three weeks after the index patient was discharged. Eventually, the outbreak organism was recovered from a total of 17 patients, with all isolates demonstrated by whole genome sequencing to be almost identical. The index isolate was resistant to all antibiotics tested, with the exception of gentamicin, tigacycline, and colistin. However, as the outbreak progressed, further resistance emerged to these three drugs as well, so that there were no effective antibiotics available for treatment for some patients. 10 of the 17 affected patients died, and the outbreak organism was responsible for death in 6 of the 10. Klebsiella pneumoniae is included as one of the escape pathogens, an acronym used to describe a group of clinically important organisms that have exhibited increasing antibiotic resistance. These include the gram-positives Enterococcus fecium and Staphylococcus aureus. Although for this discussion, I have added another S organism, Streptococcus pneumoniae. The designated gram negatives are, in addition to Klebsiella pneumoniae, Acinetobacter baumani, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, and the Enterobacteraceae. We will now discuss in greater detail the mechanisms of gram positive resistance followed by gram negative resistance. A subsequent unit will cover mycobacterial, viral, and fungal resistance. The story of penicillin resistance in three gram-positive pathogens, Streptococcus pneumoniae, Staphylococcus aureus, and Enterococcus fecium, provide insights into the issue of antibiotic resistance in general. We will discuss each pathogen's mechanism of resistance to penicillin, followed by the development of resistance to other antimicrobials. The first clinical isolates of Strep pneumoniae resistant to penicillin were not reported until 1967. 
26 years after penicillin was first used to treat a patient. These remained very uncommon until an outbreak of infections due to penicillin-resistant pneumococci were reported in South Africa in 1978. This was followed by scattered additional reports and eventually the emergence of the, quote, Spanish clone, which by the time of the 1990 Barcelona Olympics led to the fact that 40% of the pneumococci isolated in the host city were penicillin resistant. The slow but inevitable emergence of penicillin resistance in the pneumococcus was the result of alteration in its penicillin binding proteins, or PBPs, the enzymatic proteins involved in the final stages of peptidoglycan synthesis. Resistant PBPs exhibit 20 to 30 percent divergence from those of susceptible isolates. This divergence occurred over time and resulted not from mutations occurring in the pneumococcus but in its neighbors. Streptomoniae, like other streptococci, can readily acquire DNA from its environment and incorporate it into its own chromosome through a process called transformation and homologous recombination, illustrated here. This results in a mosaic structure, including mosaic PBP genes. The degree of penicillin resistance depends on the number of alleles encoding PBPs with reduced affinity for penicillin. Thus, penicillin resistance in the pneumococcus has resulted from the slow accumulation of mutated PBP encoding alleles acquired from other penicillin-exposed streptococci, including those normally colonizing the oropharynx. Penicillin resistance in Staph aureus rapidly appeared, not as the result of alterations in its PBPs, but rather as the abrupt acquisition of a plasmid encoding a beta-lactamase that hydrolyzes penicillin. This mechanism existed prior to the introduction of penicillin. PBPs do, however, play a key role in the resistance to beta-lactam antibiotics that resist the action of beta-lactamases. The introduction of penicillinase resistant semi-synthetic penicillin, or methicillin, in 1960 was followed the next year by reports of resistance. In this case, resistance is the result of horizontal transfer, probably from a coagulase negative staphylococcus, of the MEC gene encoding an altered PBP called PBP2A, which demonstrates reduced affinity for beta lactam antibiotics. Thus, in contrast to the gradual accumulation of PBP alterations in Streptococcus pneumoniae, in Staphylococcus aureus, resistance was an all-or-nothing phenomenon. The presence of low-affinity PBPs accounts for intrinsic low-level resistance of Enterococcus faecium to penicillin and ampicillin. While beta-lactamase production has also been rarely reported, high-level resistance is generally the result of mutations in PBPs. While penicillin and ampicillin resistance is problematic, the emergence and spread of vancomycin resistance is much more problematic and will be discussed in the next module. Penicillin resistance is not, of course, the whole story of antibiotic resistance in these organisms. Resistance to macrolides, tetracyclines, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole is common in Streptococcus pneumoniae. Classical hospital-acquired strains of MRSA are frequently resistant to fluoroquinolones, macrolides, clindamycin, and trimethoprim sulfamethoxazole. Vancomycin resistance in Enterococcus faecium is a growing problem, and resistance to linazolid and daptomycin is being more frequently reported among VREs.